Um, kia ora tato. good evening, and uh, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, David. And thank you very much indeed, Pauline, for inviting me to come along and share in the celebrations tonight. Uh, when uh, Pauline first got in touch with me, I was immediately interested because um, the closer I get to 70, the more I hope um, it's 50 is the new 70. Uh, and I have every confidence that CWS um, is showing all of those good attributes. Um, it was also um, a great um, pleasure to come for two other reasons. Um, first of all, um, the chance to think about what's going on in the world and the role that CWS has played over 70 years and how that role um, would inevitably change given very changing circumstances in the world um, was a very good challenge to me um, because it goes right to the heart of um, all the issues that I wrestle with. The second one is that um, uh, especially when I realized that the, uh, this evening's party and celebration is going to be here in the Cardboard Cathedral. I hope you don't mind me calling it that. Um, I was immensely fond of the old cathedral, and um, it was with huge trepidation after the earthquakes that um, uh, I, I, didn't, I wasn't looking forward to the first trip down from Auckland to Christchurch, where by the red zone would have been shrunk enough I could have got close to the old cathedral. And um, I feared that I would find it um, a very distressing experience. When it finally happened, it was an odd feeling because there was the building that I loved and many things I had participated in it. Um, but it was a very dead building. Um, almost, I felt, and please don't misunderstand this reference, it was almost like um, something from a Hollywood backlot of um, a, a set. Um, th the life had gone out of it. Now, the life might come back into it in some form, certainly um, on that site, if not in what's left of the building. But in the meantime, what's happening here in the Cardinal Cathedral is tremendously important. And so to be able to um, sit here this evening uh, for Evensong uh, with the choir and then to be able to uh, have an event like this here, um, to me is very much part and parcel of what um, uh, our life is like, um, whether we are um, in Christchurch or elsewhere in the country, uh, or whether we are Anglicans or of other faiths or, or not. Um, but that sense of community, that sense of history, um, that sense of um, challenges to be met. So um, that's what I'm going to um, try to address tonight. Um, and um, the um, main theme I want to pursue is this one of um, faithful service, um, seeing as that's exactly what CWS has been up to and will be up to for a long time to come. But it's faithful in various ways, and it's about um, our service too. And as Pauline um, mentioned earlier, um, a very um, key thought in this for me is about um, sparks in the stubble. Um, you'll recognize the biblical reference perhaps, um, and I will um, close with a wonderful um, thoughts on that from one of our great um, Episcopalian leaders. I want to um, pursue three threads tonight. Um, the first one is about um, um, crises, and the second one is about regeneration. And then the third one is about faith of various kinds. This picture was taken by the Apollo 17 astronauts as they hurtled towards the moon. They were the first people to see the world in the round, literally, um, ever, uh, as they left Earth's gravity. Now, it's become known as the blue marble photo because that's what it, the planet looked like to them. This picture is also interesting because you might notice that Africa's upside down and that is indeed the South Pole on top, which means that New Zealand must be quite close by, which is of course where we should be. Um, but out there in space, it doesn't kind of matter which way you hang, it's all very comfortable. And this was actually the view of the planet the Apollo 17 astronauts saw. Um, in, a, in essence, the planet upside down. That's a, a interesting metaphor, um, except this is what's going on with the planet. 
Um, these are the um, physical um, chemical um, boundaries of the planet as plotted by the Stockholm Resilience Institute. Um, many of them are, uh, are terms familiar to us all, like climate change. Um, novel entities would be a strange one. That's um, man-made, I should say human-made. Women do get up to some of this. Um, novel entities. Um, but the biggest breach so far is biochemical flows down at the bottom, of which one is nitrogen. That's because of the way we farm around the world. Uh, we only manage to feed ourselves because we import a lot of energy into the food system in the form of artificial fertilizers, um, such as nitrogen, such as leaches into our waterways here in Canterbury and elsewhere around the country, doing great damage. And the other place up there, sort of 11 o'clock approaching midnight, is where we are seriously um, doing great damage, which is um, to the ecosystem, which is in terms of the loss of biodiversity. The sense of um, dis-ease, i.e. illness of various kinds, ranges far and wide. Um, and it's not just of that um, environmental and ecosystem nature. Um, back in July 2013, Lynn, my wife and I, fulfilled a, a very long ambition, which was to do the pilgrimage walk um, from um, um, Saint-Jean-Pierre-de-Port in the Pyrenees across northern Spain to Santiago de Compostela. Uh, the first main town we got to was Pamplona, and um, I was um, already struck by posters I had seen uh, on villages along the way, protesting about austerity um, and government cuts and all the rest. In Pamplona, I tried to, to exercise my rights as a global citizen to remove cash from any ATM I wanted to. Um, and this was what I found, um, I couldn't. Um, such was the temporary breakdown in such global connectivity. The issues are uh, far and wide, and um, the, uh, another example is this. This was um, yet another of the financial scandals. This was earlier this year involving the foreign exchange markets. Um, one of the wonderful phrases captured on tape, um, which was, uh, became a feature of the investigation, was, um, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Then, most recently, um, just a few weeks ago, um, we were confronted by this story. This is, um, this is Paris on a good day. Um, that's um, uh, uh, nitrogen oxides of various kinds, uh, mostly from vehicles, um, causing um, smog, which actually kills people. Probably about two million people a year around the world are killed by this sort of pollution from cars. Um, but of course, the story was about Volkswagen and how it had used a little software device installed on 11 million engines in cars around the world, about 5,000 of them here in New Zealand, um, to defeat um, attempts to reduce this kind of emissions. Um, a very simple fix that meant the engines ran clean um, in tests, um, but ran um, very dirty um, out on the road. So 11 million noxious cars of various kinds. And this um, is um, a simple map of Syria and um, a total of the refugees that are immediately around it. Um, of course, there are many more elsewhere. Syria, as we'll hear more about later this evening when, um, in when we get to the appeal for Syria, um, is not just a question of um, a political collapse of some kind. Um, it is um, also exacerbated by climate change and many of the other factors that um, come to bear on this. So um, these um, sorts of um, pictures, and I uh, could show more distressing ones, but we don't need the, the, the visual reminder of, of how intense these issues are. Um, this man has obviously suffered some great um, calamity of some kind. Was it a blast or whatever? You might have seen his paper, picture in the paper um, last week. No, he is the um, chief executive of Air New Zealand, uh, oh, sorry, Air New Zealand, I take that back immediately, of Air France, um, who had had a discussion with his workers about pay rates. Um, so um, 
this sense that um, there is a lot of risk in the world um, and we aren't dealing with it at all well is palpable. One of the best guides to these risks actually comes from the World Economic Forum, the people who bring us the Davos meeting in Switzerland late January every year of the economic and political elite of the world. And uh, every year they produce a global risk analysis uh, which looks like this. Um, across the bottom is the likelihood of an event and up the vertical axis is the impact. So we need to really focus on the um, risks in the top right-hand corner, which have the highest likelihood and the highest impact. What you're seeing, though, is actually only the top quadrant of that, and I'm, there's three quarters more below it. What I'm going to do now is just focus on the top quarter of that top quarter. So I'm lo now looking at the one sixteenth of that, and this is what it looks like. So it's water crises, it's interstate conflict, it's failure of climate change adaption, that's Volkswagen. It's unemployment or underemployment, that's um, Air France. Um, it's asset bubbles, that's you know, the GFC and all the rest. It's food crises, it's profound instability, and of course it's fiscal crises too. Well, what might we do about all that? This was a little screen shot from Davos this year. Yes, it was out of focus, um, but I think it's kind of an interesting mind map that you can only blurrily see there. There are words like climate and medicine, um, and um, what's another useful word? Women out there on the far left-hand side. Um, India is in there somewhere, um, but overshadowed by Switzerland. Um, this is a meaningless jumble of words. If this is a mind map, this is a very chaotic mind. And the biggest um, phrase there is big data, uh, which is obviously um, a, a very um, disturbing thought in itself. These are the sort of discussions they have at Davos. Um, there are representatives from various countries here, like um, Finland, the Netherlands, Ireland, uh, the EU, and the UK. And um, needless to say, um, it's um, some... Pro I don't mean to be too hard on them. You know, some work happens, some progress is, is made, uh, but not of a, um, a particularly speedy or deep kind. Um, and so this is what it, Davos looks like inside, um, and this is what Davos looks like outside. Those are policemen, if you wondered. And um, we, I could touch on various issues and expressions of these um, crises in New Zealand, but I will just um, mention this one. Um, there is uh, one of the fairy terns. There are, we think, 14 breeding pairs left um, in the world. They are resident here in New Zealand. Um, on the right is one of the 55 Maori dolphins um, that are ex extant only in New Zealand waters, um, and that's one of them. Yet, even though the world's oil companies have found more oil and put it on their balance sheets than they could ever burn, or Volkswagen could, or anybody else could, um, without cooking the planet, we keep looking for more. So we're pushing out into very deep waters off New Zealand to um, push for more oil, which can never actually be used. And in the process, we're threatening the likes of fairy tern and Maui dolphins. Now, of course, lots of people would say um, that uh, that's all right, um, but others are starting to rail against this. Now, this isn't new. This is um, Lear uh, in a wonderful Victorian painting. When he realized how comprehensively he had destroyed his family, his universe, um, he railed against um, fate. And thou, all shaking thunder, strike flat the thick rotundity of the world, crack nature's moulds or germans spill at once that makes ingrateful man. We could say that a fairy tern or a Maori dolphin isn't worth very much, or if they all go, what difference does that make? Well, what we don't know is what difference it might make. Because every species we lose, we snip another strand in the web of life. Every human life we lose 
is one more person's pot infinite potential um, to make some useful contribution to these issues. The planet, as we know it today, has been through five extinctions previously, whereby the life form of each period has been essentially wiped out, there'll be a few survivors, um, due to natural disasters. This, though, um, is um, the sixth extinction, and it's the first that we humans have been around for in that we are the most evolved life form to have evolved since the last extinction. However, this one is different because we are causing this extinction. This is the Anthropocene. This is the geological period where humankind's impact is having a fundamental um, uh, change on the planet. So, how might we thus uh, regenerate um, as a result of all this? There are all sorts of um, encouraging things to keep us going on this. And um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the, uh, let me start at this point of offering three words um, to help us focus our minds on what, how we might do work on this. The first is um, ecology, from the Greek word oikos, for home. Um, and indeed, it seems perfectly appropriate that the ecosystem is indeed our home. Um, the second word is economy, from the Greek word economia, and that means the stewardship of the household. So there were three obligations in ancient Greek. Um, society. The first one was to your immediate family. The second one was to your servants and other dependents. But your third one was to your community. Uh, you were expected to play a constructive role in your society. And then the third one, of course, is ethics, from the Greek um, for ethos, nature or disposition. Now, these are words that uh, are familiar to us, and, but, but trying to establish some new connection between them um, is, um, is our fundamental task. And I think it's kind of uh, a lovely echo of civilization, if you like, um, that those words come from ancient Greek, and yet the origins of the Christian word service was trying to help modern Greek reestablish it, so Greece reestablish itself um, after the Second World War. The um, next point there is that if we find a new relationship here between ecology, economy, and ethics, maybe we can restore our relationship with, with each other and between us and the planet so that we work with nature, not against it. One of the most interesting areas of technology, one of the most helpful, is called biomimicry, where in, in our effort to work with nature, the not against it, um, we borrow from nature and we return to nature. So, for example, in the middle picture at the top is a modern office complex in Harare um, in Zimbabwe. Now, Harare is quite high up. I think it's about 5,000 feet. And therefore, it's hot during the day and it's cold at night. And yet, this is a modern office building which has no mechanical heating or cooling or ventilation because it's designed on the air circulation principles of an ant heap, whilst the office accommodation is still commodious. Um, and it's that sense that we could um, fundamentally shift our technology um, so that we could work with the planet, not against it, uh, and with the ecosystem um, it is obviously a, a fundamentally important concept. This building is in New Zealand. This is um, Tuhoi's wonderful um, place in the Uruweras. It's the first living building in New Zealand. This is one uh, which meets all its own uh, power and water needs and the recycling of that water too. It's a very challenging technical specification to meet the living building specifications, but this it does. What doubly appeals to me about this building is that it's a beautiful expression of us. This is clearly not a living building in Seattle, where the discipline started, or anywhere else in the world. And so whatever we do on this needs to reflect absolutely who we are and what distinctive role we can play in the world. I touched on the uh, ocean earlier, and the basic 
um, question here is that we are responsible for the fourth largest chunk of ocean in the world. Um, and after Antarctica's waters, our oceans have the second highest level of endemic species, i.e. unique um, to us. Um, and therefore, there's no way that we could ever find a way to uh, look after this enormous chunk of the ecosystem using conventional ways of ships, airplanes, to on patrol to try and track down people doing the wrong thing and the like. Um, this is about um, some fundamental change in how uh, we might um, be able to do these things. In looking at this in a global perspective, there is a wonderful um, British economist called Kate Rayworth. Indeed, she um, used to be the co-editor of the United Nations Human Development Report every year, working in the UNDP, the part of the UN that um, Helen Clark now runs. And after that, she worked for uh, many years for Oxfam. And one of her wonderful catchphrases, which appeals to me, why it's time to um, valid, uh, vandalize the economic textbooks. But this is Kate's conception. Um, it's about um, a social foundation, that's the inner ring, and that's water, income, education, resilience, voice, jobs, energy, social equity, gender equity, health and food. So that's about people and communities that are strong and resilient and can grow and develop. The outer rings is the environmental ceiling. Those are the planetary boundaries I showed you earlier. So, but on, built on that social floor, but within the environmental ceiling, is the safe and just place for humanity, where inclusive and sustainable economic development can happen. Whilst these issues are absolutely global, and one of the notable features about them is incredibly, how incredibly interdependent they are, there's no place to hide, um, it's very clear that um, the, these solutions are increasingly local because um, we need to achieve an absolutely unprecedented speed of change and scale of change and complexity of change um, that humankind has never come within Kui before. So these solutions require very strong learning communities, the sort of communities around the world that Christian World Service supports. I've been thinking for a long time that these communities, whether they're in our country or others, or the communities um, that we help overseas, demonstrate uh, and live by three very important attributes. Um, the first one is a real common sense, a common understanding of what's going on and what needs to be done. Then they have a real common purpose about how they're going to do it, and then they have a real sense of common wealth i.e. what the benefit is for all and how that is shared. And then these are places where individuals are valued and helped and encouraged, and so in turn they can participate and change. This is um, uh, Gus Speth, who incidentally was uh, the person before last running the UNDP, between, there was a person between Gus and Helen. And a few years ago, um, Gus, who's an environmental scientist, said this. I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems. But, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. This is an American writer, um, uh, Roy Scranton. And he has said recently in his latest book, the greatest challenge we face is a philosophical one, understanding that this civilization is already dead. The sooner we confront our situation and realize there is nothing we can do to save ourselves, the sooner we can get down to the difficult task of adapting with mortal humility to the new reality. His book sounds grim, but I actually find it quite inspiring. Um, it's called um, um, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene. 
So where does faith help us on this journey? Back in 1967, an American historian and theologian, Lynn White, um, wrote a seminal paper. In it, as a Christian, he analyzed how um, our concept of what we believe God had created nature for was leading us very seriously astray. And said, in fact, he said, of all the major faiths in the world, Christianity is the most anthropomorphic centric. In other words, we think that God created nature and this wonderful biodiversity for us. Um, and therefore, we would be in dominion over it. Maybe we might soften that, that we're stewards of it, we're in charge of it. But one of the memorable um, lines that, um, or quotes that Lynn White um, wrote in 1967 um, was this one. Both our present science and our present technology are so tinctured with orthodox Christian arrogance towards nature that no solution for our ecologic crisis can be expected from them alone. Since the roots of our trouble are so largely religious, the remedy must also be essentially religious, whether we call it that or not. We must rethink and refeel our nature and destiny. Back to that mind map from Davos. That view of the world has what has given us this very muddled mind map of the world um, where humankind believes it's in charge. What might a different mind map look like? Perhaps one like this. Just savor some of the words there and if you're a bit far at the back and you can't see the screen up, pick out the bigger words. God, human, world, also, life, environment, nature, creation, one, good, countries, present, resources, social, new, common. This is a mind map of Pope Francis's recent encyclical, Praise Be. So each word is in relation to how often he used that word in the encyclical. I think this is a very different mind map um, that might guide us um, in many ways. Pope Francis in that encyclical says, a sober look at our world shows that the degree of human intervention, often in the services of business interests and consumerism, is actually making our earth less rich and beautiful, even more limited and gray. Even as technology advances and consumer goods continue to abound limitlessly, we seem to think that we can substitute an irreplaceable and irretrievable beauty with something we have created ourselves. On a harder note, he said, if we destroy creation, creation will destroy us. A few weeks ago, Pope Francis went to the United States. He went to Capitol Hill. This is him doing a kind of a Vatican balcony thing um, from the steps of uh, the balcony of Congress looking down the mall. It was, I wasn't there, I was in the States at the time, but I wasn't um, there um, in the um, House uh, of Representatives when um, Pope Francis gave his speech. But this is a remarkable picture of the Pope surrounded by American politicians. As I was looking for pictures about this, I found it one that a representative had tweeted. It's this picture, um, which is, uh, sorry, it's this picture, um, which um, above Pope Francis is that famous American phrase, in God we trust, which not only appears behind the Speaker of the House of Representatives, um, but also appears, for example, on every banknote that is produced in the United States. Apparently, the US trusts in God and the rest of us too. How can theology help? I am not a theologian, I am an Anglican, and therefore as an Anglican, uh, I'm actually a Jaffa too, but that's just because I'm another faithful Anglican. Um, but um, this is my Anglican attempt at um, theology around some of this. So if theology is about our understanding of God, um, maybe, 
maybe, not maybe, they are, some key elements are the gift, God's radical abundance of this ecosystem and of life itself. It's about relationship between God, his, her, its, creation, and us. It's about redemption. It's about being made whole. Not just us, but us as whole, as part of a whole creation. We are consumers of what God has made. We are in communion with it, Rowan Williams said when he was Archbishop of Canterbury. Then from theology, um, what about um, faith? Faith is our response to God in many ways. So it's about um, our um, belief, it's about our empowerment that that brings, it's about our enlightenment. Um, and um, here's another quote. This is um, about science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind. And that was Albert Einstein. Community is where we live out these things. So um, community um, is about how we act out our understanding of God, how we relate to one another, how we discuss with each other, how we understand each other, how we support each other, and how we act together. Whether it is supporters of, or people working in Christian world service and communities around the world, or whether it's us here in Christchurch or in Auckland or any other place where some of the 7.3 million people on the planet meet as we head towards 10 billion people. Two more words which I think are useful. The one is about inspiration, um, from the Latin inspirare, to breathe into, as in a spirit, and enthusiasm, from the Greek enthos, possessed by a god. So if faith can somehow inspire us and can somehow enthuse us, um, then maybe that'll help us, um, uh, help others um, on this great journey. There is, of course, a great opportunity here for us because we should be, and indeed we are on occasions, good at this, about bringing people together, about multi uh, to try and help deal with multiple interlinked global crises. And as I said, paradoxically, the best response to these is local, multiplied up across the world. There is also an enormous challenge in this for us as um, people of all faiths, not just Christians, um, about what we need to do. We certainly need to apply timeless faith as our understanding of these issues, um, but we also need to find contemporary responses to that um, in service. So what might various marks of service be? And how might those marks change and adapt to reflect um, technology, society, um, the uh, very different challenges we have in this very interdependent world today? I'm going to suggest five um, this evening. Um, these aren't five ways to radically change what Christian World Service does. In many ways, Christian World Service already reflects this. Um, but I will um, try to slightly broaden them out, to, to slightly extend them, um, to see if that might help us work out what um, faithful service might look like. It seems to me that the um, biggest change of all um, is um, is about, um, the first change is about mutual. I know this has been changing over recent decades, but um, very much uh, the historic view of um, development aid or disaster relief and all the rest was a one-way street. It was gifts of money and resources and time and effort um, from people who have to people who haven't. But it's really, really significant that the United Nations has moved on from the Millennium Development Goals, which was about the third world, to Sustainable Development Goals, which is about the whole world. Because the issues we're dealing with here are 
have their um, lives lived out even in the richest countries of the world. So this isn't a first world, third world thing anymore. It's about all of us. But very crucially, what people pioneer and devise in what we might consider the developing world or the third world um, actually are things that we need to feed, learn from. So this is very much a mutual relationship um, and um, one where we can learn and benefit a great deal from each other. The next one is about the inspiration bit. Um, it's about finding ways to inspire people, whether it's um, people for whom we seek support, um, whether it's inspiring ourselves as to how we might work, whether it's inspiring the people we work with. The third one is about infinitesimal, i.e. so infinitely small. Anything any one of us does, any dollar any one of us puts into a collection, any thought any one of us has about all these issues is truly infinitely small. And that's the small change, both in money terms and change as in transformation. But we know that when you start compounding infinitesimally small things, uh, one on the other, something quite infinite happens. So in a world that we think of as a very finite world, you know, there is one world, there is one ecosystem, that sense that God's gift to us of life, both the life of the ecosystem, but our lives in it, actually is infinite. And one of the great things should be is of us human beings is that we have an infinite capacity um, to think and reflect and act on uh, what we might do, what we have to do. And the last one is faithful. Faithful in all senses of the world, um, the very broad sense of being full of faith, believing that things can be done, uh, in the sense of being true to something, the issues, what we're striving for, and of course, um, faithful um, in our Christian sense terms, and indeed of all other faiths too, not just Christian, and indeed we have a lot to learn from other faiths because they are far less anthropocentric than we are, and yet care of the creation is one, is the great unifying theme across all the world's great faiths. That's one thing we don't disagree about or split hairs about. Um, and therefore, um, a, 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 a multi-faith response to this is incredibly powerful. So faith um, is, um, is something we give expression to regularly. Um, in my parish, St. Andrew's Epsom, uh, we are celebrating a four-week care of creation season here, which we started the Sunday before last on St. Francis Day. In our liturgy, we are using um, a reworking of the affirmation of faith. I'm going to offer it to you now. If anybody would like to join in as we go through it, please do. We believe in God who creates all things, who embraces all things, who celebrates all things, who is present in every part of creation. We believe in God as the source of life, who baptizes this planet with living water, who heals all the wounds of the earth. We believe that God's love is written in the earth like a book of life unfolding a book revealing the mysteries of God's wisdom. We believe in Jesus Christ as the revelation and wisdom of God. Joining in the web of life as a human being, Jesus is the love of God immersed in creation. We believe in an earth community, a community where the lives of all creatures are interconnected. We believe in life forever, empowered by the breath of the Holy Spirit of God, connected with Christ and celebrated by all creation. Amen. One last thought. 
Um, in July 2010, in Rio de Janeiro, the Rio Plus 20 summit was held. Trying to work out how much progress had been made in the last 20 years since 1992 when the great Rio Declaration on Sustainability was signed. 55,000 delegates were there, uh, very few politicians numerically, most of the, they, were, they thought it was their agenda, but most of the 55,000 people were from civil society. I was one of them. Um, and the um, politicians there were deeply disappointing. They finally produced a 283 point statement, um, which had a few we should, we might, we could, um, but no sense of will or urgency. Kumi Naidu, the head of Greenpeace International, tweeted, it was the longest suicide note in history. Before the summit started on the Sunday, I went up to Christ the Redeemer. It was shrouded in cloud. And I thought of these words, uh, which are from um, Catherine Jefford Scurry, the presiding bishop, uh, Episcopal bishop in the United States, which she preached on All Souls Day in Washington Cathedral in 2006. Let the pain of the world seize us by the throat. Listen for Jesus calling us all out of our tombs of despair and apathy. May the shock of baptismal dying once more set us afire. This place we call home is meant to be a new heaven, a new earth, a holy city, a new Jerusalem. It is the sparks and it is the sparks in the stubble that make it so. And quite simply, we are those sparks. Thank you very much.